We love unbelievers. God loves them. We know that we want to share the truth and the life we've experienced with them because we want them to come into the experience of being in Christ. But they don't have a grid for you and I. We don't fit into the grid. Here they're living their world. They're programmed by media, programmed by education, programmed by culture, programmed by their religions. They're programmed by philosophy. They're programmed by how they're raised in their family environment. Everything, they're just programmed. They're just programmed. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the ones that run our world behind the scenes, the people that are in control of certain things, that sit at the top of the mountains of influence in society, they know these things. So they program generations to act the way they want, to control the minds of human culture. And behind them sit, according to the Bible, Ephesians 6, is spiritual entities, invisible entities that cooperate with these people to bring about their doctrines, their teachings, their ways of living, and communicate them through the mediums that are available in this world. Hello. That's the truth. Then you come in the world, and God shows up, and you become a new creation, a new species of origin. You're like brand new. Everything's passed away, but you're still in the world. You're like, what am I doing here now? How do I live? And this is one of the things you and I face that always challenges our identity. You run into people that are unable to recognize this uniqueness about you that you are different because you're a child of God. They don't know that context. They don't have a context whether you're a child of God. They don't have a context that you're a new species of origin, you're a new creation, that old things have passed away. They don't have a context that God's not trying to evolve your old man, but he's allowing your new man to live forth. Isn't that more exciting to live than trying to raise the dead all the time? It's a lot easier. I mean, come on, raising the dead and the person's dead all the time, you're carrying them everywhere. Most people are walking around everywhere carrying their old man around. I know Jesus and here's my old man. I'm trying to raise him up still. That gets tiring after a while, right? It gets tiring. But meanwhile, the world does not know him and therefore does not know your children. Doesn't know about your new identity, in other words. Doesn't know about your new grid and way of thinking. But this, mess, this problem happens in your mind. So they look at you, they try to fit you in a box, but they don't have a right box for you. They don't have the right box in their mindset, in their grid, in their worldview. So they take you and try to squeeze you into a box and push that on you and push that identity on you, push that on you. And they try to make you part of their culture. And say, so, you know, in order for you to be accepted, you got to be like us. Because the truth is we don't know how to be like you. But the truth of the matter is, when you know who you are, they're going to want to change and become like Christ, just like you are in Christ. Are you with me? That's what it's saying. The sharing of your faith becomes effective. The ignition is turned on when you acknowledge, I know who I am in Christ. You, it might be okay for you to live that way, and I don't judge you because I love you. Because I may used to have lived that way too. You know what I'm saying? It's not about, we're not here to judge people. We're not here to criticize people. That's the problem. When you, don't, when you don't understand who you are in Christ and why you are in Christ the way you are, because of his unique grace, because he showed you kindness when you didn't deserve it, because he's been merciful to you, because he's been graceful for you, because he didn't ask any questions or interview you, he showed you his grace and is constantly, continuously, always showing you his mercy and grace. Eventually you're captured by such amazing love that you're broken down to pieces and you're like, oh God. I accept who you've made me in Christ. And I realize it will always be you. It will never be about me. And then the sharing of your faith becomes effective. A confidence comes. A humility comes. A compassion comes. A love comes out of you that is not yours, but it's the love of Christ. And they experience love. Oh, the aphrodisiac of God's love is more powerful than anything else in the world. And they have tried everything. They have tried, and many of you have tried everything, and how happy did that get you? Hello. But there's something inside all of us that is looking for genuine love. And that's why he says, what manner of love have I bestowed upon you that you are my children? See, you've got to think on that a little bit. You've got to chew on that a little bit. You've got to dive deep into that and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Just by sitting in this environment, I can sense a shift in people's thinking. You're already starting to think differently about yourself compared to how you saw yourself throughout the last week, maybe. We have to reevaluate and see ourselves as God sees us based on what he says about us. Because what he says you can stand on. You can depend on it. You can take it to the bank. Everything else is flimsy. 
But what he says is guaranteed. It's going to work for you. We need to be reminded. That's why I keep coming back to stuff like this. Because I know the world's trying to tear down your identity, tear down our identity. But God wants to affirm who you are. Him. He wants you to know in Christ Jesus, what's in you is good stock. You have good seed in you. I have more faith in the good seed in you than I do in the old man that you might be carrying around. That's why I believe in people. I believe in people because I have faith in the seed that remains in you. I have faith in what is in you because who's in you is Christ himself. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Christ lives in you. It doesn't matter what circumstances have told you, the world has told you, or what your life has told you. You need to listen to the different narrative. There is another narrative concerning your life, and it is the narrative of who you are in Christ. It is the narrative of what God has written about you because who you are is fearfully and wonderfully made. Not only were you created in the image of God like all humanity is today, but there's a difference between you and the world. They're still carrying a residue of God's image like you used to, but now you are born of God. You are literally born of God, born from above, born again. You are born of God. You are not impersonating Christ. You are personating him. You are literally his person to the world. What does that mean? You are his bone. You are his flesh. You are not bone of his bone. You're not flesh of his flesh. You are his body. You are his bone. You are his flesh. You are Christ to the world because Christ is in you. And if you find out who he is, you'll find out who you are. Christ means we're little Christ. And in him we are Christ. That's who you and I are. So the world doesn't know how to deal with that. So you can't get... I, I'm bold in, about the way I live. I don't care who an unbeliever I'm not, Because I know the way I live is better than the way they live. <laughs> Hello. Amen. Come on now. Because you know what? And you know you don't have to be ashamed of living the way God's called you to live. You don't have to be ashamed to be set apart. Let me tell you something. Did you hear what they said? That they belong to the world. We are in the NLT. 1 John 3. But we belong to God. If you read chapter 3 on, I'll keep talking about you belonging to God. You belong to Him. And you have Christ in you, but you're in Christ. Your acknowledgement of you being in Christ affirms who you are 